Welcome to the Next 7 Days podcast series, where we break the season down into week-by-week segments, bringing on a new guest hunter every week that specializes in their time frame. We're starting off at September 14th and running to November 30th, covering every segment of the season, starting with early season into the October lull into the rut and the secondary rut. So let's get ready to hunt the next seven days. Welcome to the Whitetail Legacy Podcast, coming at you with episode two of the Next Seven Days series. And today we are talking with Ethan Eskew. Shout out to Ethan. He already put down a red antlered buck early, early season using the exact tactics that he talks about in this episode. So let's not wait around. Let's get right into it and get into the people that make this possible so we can get into the show. Starting off with Exodus Outdoor Gear. If you're in the market to pick up that one, two, three last cell cams to get you really in the game, get that most recent information, um, look no further than Exodus, the Exodus Render. It is the best cell camera on the market. One thing I love to do with my Exodus Render um, is I like to keep one not deployed here handy. If I go and take it with me when I go pull cards, and if I have a card that's really, really hot and a buck's daylighting, I'll throw that render up. I like to keep it not deployed, and at the first of the season, that's how I've been able to kill these bucks really early is having that mobile cam when I find a buck that's daylighting in an area, hang that mobile cam and get that most uh, recent information. And I know if I hang the Exodus render out there, it's going to perform, it's going to send me pictures. And I also have that five-year warranty and theft coverage if I want to hang that on public and not have to worry about. I'm also shooting the new Exodus MMT arrows. Just broke out the fresh half dozen um, and started shooting those. I've been target practicing all all, uh, preseason here with uh, six, and I just brought out the second six and shooting them. Shooting them out of the tree stand this last weekend, really dying them in. And I'm absolutely in love with these arrows. They're shooting flat, true, and I can't say anything negative about these arrows can't wait to see how they penetrate on deer and uh, get the job done i know they will a lot of people are already getting kills with these arrows and i'm super jealous that it's not me but hopefully i'm on a couple and i can get it done early Um, next we got afflictor broadheads i've talked a lot about the k2 head which i'll be shooting but they also that's a fix but they also have some mechanicals so i want to talk to you about the hybrid ext afflictor Um, This is an inch and a half cutting to hammered hybrid broadhead. So it is a mechanical. Um, It has the same head as the the same half inch head up front as the K2, that cutting head. That's what I really like about them. They have a really heavy head up front to get that initial cut on contact. Um, It's a fixed and a mechanical. So it's a hybrid broadhead. It's both. It's 100 grains. um, And and I've heard a lot of good things about it. I've seen Exodus shoot them. I actually got a pack of these. And I will be trying them, um, but they do have fixed and mechanicals if you're in the market for either one. I know a lot of people will not shoot a fixed head. Um, that's something that I'm switching to this year, and I'm loving it. The, the K2 is flying perfect. Um, I believe it's one of the most underrated uh, broadheads on the market right now. Um, and that's it, guys. Let's get right into the show and get Ethan on. All right, we got Ethan Eskew on. How are you doing tonight, man? doing good how are you i should say today i normally don't record podcasts during the day but the stars aligned and we were able to jump on here real quick and get this yeah i actually had a little bit of time today so we hit it perfect yeah it's perfect so i got your information from jake bush absolute slayer and i said hey i need a slayer from you know that's out there killing it to talk about the 21st to the 28th and he's like oh i got your guy so i was able to get that contact information and get you on here so uh, starting off here, just do a brief introduction about yourself and some of the success that you've had throughout the years. Yeah, so Ethan SQ, um, mechanical engineer by day and a hunting addict by the days that I'm not at work and the, the days that I am at work. <laughs> um, I've had, you know, quite a bit of early season success the last handful of years, um, especially the last five years. Up until the last five years, I would say I was definitely a pre-rut and rut hunter kind of relied on that for my success but over the last five years um, I started doing some things a little bit differently and now you could not take September away from me from a whitetail standpoint uh, if you tried I would 10 out of 10 times choose September over November 
um, for whitetails as far as getting a big deer on the ground. Um, you know, so I've shot, I'll have to do some counting for a second. I forget how many I've shot in September the last five years. Almost all the deer I've, I've killed the last five years, um, I've shot in September. I've shot, I, I shot two in November last year, but other than that, I think that almost everything has been in September. Um, and I've, you know, gotten on multiple deer that I've passed or, um, you know, unfortunately as it goes, there have been some arrows released that did not result in a buck at my feet. Uh, but those were also in September. So yeah, I've shot, like I said, I'd, I'd have to count. There's been quite a few over the last five years in September. So I've kind of gotten to the point now where that is my, that's my time frame, my favorite time frame. Um, that's where I put the most emphasis on as far as the entire year is getting on one in September. Yeah, no, if, if Jake Bush says, Hey, this dude's a killer in September, that's a guy that you trust. Um, but I seen uh, on your page there that you were with him when he killed that giant public land a couple years ago. So, um, excited to chat with you about this time of year. So September 21st to 28th here in, you know, in the Midwest, a lot of the States aren't open, but a lot of other States it's, it's in the game 100 percent right now so um what are the bucks doing during this time of year yeah so the 21st to 28th the bucks are out of velvet which deer change when they shed velvet um you know i think the earlier in september the better personally especially if you're really early if you're in, in a state or area that you can actually hunt them early enough to where they're in velvet to me that's the best but like you said, there's a lot of areas that just aren't open that early. And the later into September you get, the more areas open. So that last week of September that we're talking about here is kind of crucial uh, because you just got more opportunity in more states. And so like I said, those bucks, they're out of velvet. Um, they aren't even thinking about the rut yet, though. So they are in this kind of transitional period to me where you know they're not doing exactly what they did all summer long but they're not even thinking about rut even thinking about pre-rut to me you know they're just they're just eating and and bedding and i mean that's really all they're doing is eating and bedding um and traveling back and forth so you know the the main thing you got to focus on during that time frame is finding the, the food source and that that can vary big time um you know where i live i'm i'm not one to talk on crops much because we don't have crops where i live i've never been an ag hunter um so i can't speak to that during this time frame too effectively but if you're in an area that doesn't have crops you know i know that during this time frame um hard and soft mass is going to be um, big big time food source and then you will have years that you don't have mass um, like i think it was last year actually um where i live we had no acorns no apples nothing you know all the all the mass was just not there last year so these these bucks uh typically around here well they will feed in like hay fields and pastures and stuff um the majority of the summer and then on a normal year around mid-september the acorns start dropping and then you've got this transitional period in this last week of september where they start transitioning off those green food sources and more onto the mast in the timber um but to me on if you have a year that has a really bad mast like we did last year those bucks actually still hit those green food sources into the last week of september because they didn't have anything to transition to so that gave you more time and more opportunity to exploit them on their summer pattern you know their summer pattern they do the same thing for three months and then once hunting season rolls around they start transitioning from week to week so I think something important to keep in mind is the year that you're in, because you, for example, last year there was no mast and they stayed on that summer pattern two to three weeks longer than they I've ever seen them do actually. Um, 
but you have other years that it's a crazy good last year and you might even have some early droppers in early to mid September and they might start, you know, transitioning their food sources uh, even quicker. So it really depends on the year and, you know, to, to stay on top of that, you got to stay on top of the deer, whether that's glassing, trail cameras, um, whatever, you got to stay on top of the deer. Then you also have to stay on top of the food source that they're utilizing. Yeah, this is a weird time of year. Even like for me on trail cams, you can see it. There's the switch of velvet sheds already happened, but then um, a lot of like around here in the Midwest, the farmers, some farmers are getting in the field. Some people are cutting hay and baling it. So the acorns might start dropping. I've, I've noticed already that our acorns are dropping a little bit and you just start losing and gaining bucks um, right before season. And uh, like you said, following the food sources is key right now because that's pretty much all they're wanting to do early october um late september is just bed to food and in between uh so if you could go into a perfect setup where you got the perfect wind perfect weather perfect location to where you think you would kill a buck what would that be so it's all gonna vary but during this week i'd say there's two there there's two perfect setups to me and it just depends on the year, like I said, because last year um, I got a shot at a buck in this in this time frame, um, five or six year old deer, <laughs> just old, really cool deer. Um, and he was on a field edge, actually, and that would have never happened any other year. But it was a perfect setup. You know, you're on the field edge. Um, this this buck was betting basically right off the field edge. So I didn't want to push too close to his bed because he was literally betting maybe 75 yards from the field edge. So, you know, I pushed in right to the edge um, and I caught him coming out and, and got my shot. But the only reason he was still hitting, the only reason he was still betting there and still feeding in that field was, like I said, there was no mass. Um, other years, you know, I would say, on the average year, my perfect setup would be in the timber, um, a good acorn producing flat close to bedding, but it, it has to be, you know, I hunt specific deer. I don't hunt spots or I don't hunt, you know, good looking areas personally, because where I'm at, I try to kill the absolute biggest deer in the area and I have to find that deer before. So if I know that the buck I'm wanting to shoot is bedding in a certain area, you know, I will, I will hunt the closest oak flat. Um, or it doesn't even have to be a flat. I've had good success before just under many times, actually under one tree. Um, the, again, the woods where I live, they aren't overly, um, populated with oaks, so sometimes you'll have a, a big hardwood stand and you'll have one massive oak tree in the middle of it. And sometimes I actually prefer that because it acts as like a focal point. It draws everything right to that one tree. Um, but, but yeah, as far as being perfect, you know, I, I want to be even on that field as an example, you know, I was within a hundred yards of where that deer was bedding. So you want to be close to the bed to where you know that you're going to catch that buck in daylight. You want to be on the way to or at the food source, just depending on the setup, you know, I've, I've killed them on the way to food. I've killed them at the food. Um, I really like cold fronts in, in that last week of September, you know, you can still have real warm days. Like if you have, you know, three or four days in a row where it's like 80 degrees and then all of a sudden you get a cold front and it's a high of 65 or, or something along those lines, the movement, always seems insane on those days um so if you know where that buck's at if you know where he's betting you know you know or have a good guess as to where he's feeding and you can put all that together with that cold front there's a really good chance you're gonna get a shot of that deer so that's kind of like the perfect setup to me yeah sounds perfect to me too just that bed to food transition setting up there but like you said that time of year even for early October for us, you got to get really tight to those beds to see those deer unless you have that cold front like you're that you were talking about. So right. getting into some fun would you let rathers, and this is something that um, I, want, I threw in these episodes to kind of mix up the tactic talk. So eliminate all spider webs early season 
or eliminate all mosquitoes? You got one or the other. What are you doing? For actual hunting, I'm going to say getting rid of the mosquitoes because you just sit in your tree up there and get get blasted yeah, by get them. smoked. I mean, the mosquitoes right. you could keep away with, with something, but the spider webs, they just sneak right up on you. Most of the time, that's right. pulling cams in the summertime, though. And, right. That's what I was going to say. If you're talking scouting, yeah. then I'm taking the spider webs. <laughs> but if you're talking actual hunting, yeah. I'm taking the mosquitoes. Those damn spider webs, I've been hanging cams, and I'm like, there's got to be a bajillion, a legit number of bajillion spiders out here in the woods to have this many spider webs. So. Oh, yeah. Yep. Right. I always take a little stick and <laughs> yeah. wave it in front yeah. of me. I If I'm on pi- private, I take my machete because I, I hate getting <laughs> yeah. blank pictures, uh, you know, a trail cam. So I'll just hacksaw everything out in front of it but i just use that pretty much use the holder for that and just wave it up and down but all right number two kill 130 inch buck still in velvet or 145 inch out of velvet 145 out of velvet 145 out of velvet. i don't have a velvet deer but i mean 15 inches is a lot people don't think that's a lot but when you get it on a frame of a deer it it adds up pretty quick so yeah. i mean for me it's i've killed i've killed velvet deer and i've killed you know mostly hard one deer and you know velvet is cool i will say that it's also a pain you know like <laughs> yeah I, i'm assuming yeah to try to get that to the taxidermist all together and keep it nice it's probably a pain pain in the butt right i actually do my own taxidermy um so you know that does help a little bit but like just getting the deer out of the woods or you know like you can't just grab the rack and drag it out um yeah you know it's velvet is cool and i don't get me wrong like i love velvet deer just because it's earlier in the year and the earlier i can hunt the better but um it is kind of a pain so if, if you're making me choose between a smaller velvet or a bigger hard one i'm taking the bigger 145 for sure all right last one hunt in hot temps or strong winds this time of year strong winds yeah, I would take strong. I have personally, I haven't noticed a huge deterrent in deer activity as it relates to strong winds, unless you're talking like gale force stuff, you know. Yeah, but I haven't. Not, I haven't seen a huge, big, you know, like if it's twenty fifteen, you know, they still they're still moving, you know. Right. Yeah, I I hundred percent agree. And actually, you know, if I if I really dig into that. I know that's just kind of a fun question, but if you dig into that a little bit more during this time of year, if you have high winds, you typically have some type of weather front. So, you know, with some type of weather front, it's either going to come a cold front or you're going to have a big shift in barometric pressure. Uh, you're going to have uh, different types of precipitation. You know, you get to precipitation during this week of September. You know, that's typically a good time to, you know, hunt those scrapes. If you're on the right scrape, it's... Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm definitely, I'm taking the high winds for sure. Because like I said, the high winds are typically a, re- a result of some type of front. And I, I feel like you can, you can utilize any type of front to your advantage if you do it properly. But just a stagnant, hot day is the, my least favorite to run. Yeah, those are awful, man. But yeah, like you said, last night I was out riding on the four-wheeler and it was nice out. But then I got on the four-wheeler with shorts and t-shirt and it was cold. So if you have strong winds, it's also going to lower the temperature some of no matter what it says it is, what it feels like out there. And that's what these deer run off of is, you know, what it feels like. That's why I think after a rain, there's really good movement because there is a temperature drop. It's like a cold front just came through. You know, there's a temp drop where drop the temp down 10, 15 degrees. And those deer are like, okay, I'm going to get up and move. Um, But yeah, I, I definitely agree on the high winds there. So getting back into the the tactic talk here, uh, the food sources, you said you're, you know, soft and hard mass is key. Um, if you have ag, you know, finding the right ag, um, maybe some food plots, if you have food plots this time of year, but, uh, this time of year, you're, if you're on that soft mass on the food source, are you doing mostly evening hunts? Mostly. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I, I am not the person that says, oh, you know, early season is evening only because I don't agree with that at all. I've had I've had good success early in mornings. Um, I will say that I'm primarily an evening hunter 
you know, but that's just because typically I feel like I have a better chance in the evening. But like I said, I've had success in the mornings and it's just, it just depends on the deer, where he's bedding, what food source he's using, the area. There's, there's a lot of variables, but I'm definitely not an evening only hunter in the, in the early season. All right. Um, going, you mentioned scrapes earlier. So going on here, um, scrape hunting, if you are hunting a scrape this time of year, what would the scenario need to be um, for that to happen? Yeah, so I, so you know, I think September scrapes are far, far different from October and November scrapes. You know, September scrapes are more of those primary hubs where you know deer are coming to it as a communication and interaction uh, interface at these scrapes. Whereas you know, you get into like mid late October you get these pre rub bucks they they just walk around the woods popping up scrapes everywhere you know what I mean so for me in September that last week of September if you have a big uh primary scrape especially if you've been able to hunt an area for a few years if that scrape is there every year you know that's a that's a communication hub for these deer um and I personally haven't had too much uh, personal success putting deer down early season on scrapes, but I have friends that definitely have. And um, like I said, I think that the the key thing to keep in mind there is you want to hunt. If, you, if you're going to hunt a scrape during this time frame, it's got to be a primary scrape. Um, a perennial primary, I think, would be even better. One that's been there for years and it's got to be close to the bed again uh, everything relates back to you know for me i'm hunting a specific buck always so you know if you know i said my perfect scenario earlier um but really the the perfect scenario would probably be you got a target buck you know he's bedded right here there's a food source 100 150 yards away but right before that food source or, or or in the food source or something there's that uh primary scrape you know right there you know that's you're stacking everything up on you know where the buck's bedded you're on the travel route you're on you're at the scrape you're next to or at the food source um i just as far as hunting the scrapes like i said i think it's got to be a primary scrape um it's got to be close to the bed and it's got to be one that it's going to be hit during daylight hours. And to me, that's, you know, like I said, close to the beds, number one in cover, um, field edge scrapes, you know, they happen this time of year, but you know, bucks are, they're out there hitting those after dark, typically, you know, just, um, smelling the licking branches, getting communication with other deer, but those aren't something I would ever really key in on during this time of year. It's got to be close to the bed in the cover. Yeah, I agree. The only thing I would add to that is if a guy's out there and he's got a scrape that's on the edge of a standing cornfield, which you said you don't have a lot of ag, I see had a lot of success on trail cams running them on the edge of a standing cornfield. There's something about that corn being there that it's almost like they're still in the timber, and they seem to hit those um, earlier in the day, um, but you still want to be close to bedding, but it might not need to be really really tight on that bedding that they're coming there it's a scrape on the food source that they're actually hitting but for it to be in daylight it needs to be on a standing cornfield i've had really good success on that um so last topic here if you could tell anybody out there that's going to be hunting this week um one or two things that you think would help them be more successful what would that be have a specific deer in mind um that kind of goes for almost every week of the season for me though. But, you know, for me, if you have one specific deer in mind, you know, to me, that just helps your, and I'm not saying like, it's the only deer you're going to hunt all season. You might have five different bucks that you're going after, but when you go in to hunt, you have that deer for that day that you're after, um, you know, personally, if I don't have that, I'm not hunting. Like I will, I will not hunt unless I have the buck that I'm after. I will keep scouting. 
So that's my number one tip is have a buck in mind. You know, that changes a little bit in the rut. You, you know, you can always get lucky in the rut. And I think that's why the majority of people kill in the rut and get lucky in the rut. Um, but if you're not in the rut, the, my biggest tip by far is hunt with a purpose you know, have a specific deer in mind every time you go into the field to hunt. And if you don't have that, don't hunt. Just keep scouting until you find that deer and then formulate the plan and then go in and kill him. And I know that's not like super tactic driven for that specific week. Um, but I think that, you know, that is my number one uh, tip for that week. And like I said, any week outside of the rut, my success has went up tenfold since I started hunting with that mentality. You know, there's some years that I barely hunt. I might hunt five times, but I might kill, you know, two or three deer <laughs> in those five hunts. Um, it's, I'm, I'm definitely a scouter more than I am a hunter anymore. And I think that that's, like I said, helped my success tenfold. Yeah, I agree with that time of year, especially if, if you're just trying to go into an area that has bucks, a lot of times you're, you're either going to be in an area that, you think's good, but you're not, you're not sure what's that, and you're wasting a hunt. Like you said, if you have a target buck in mind that you know is there, that you can make a move on, make something happen, um, that's the time of year, especially if you can hunt this time of year before they make that drastic rut change um, to, to strike. So I like that tactic a lot. Just, you know, go in with a purpose, go in after one buck, and put the pieces together on one buck instead of trying to put the pieces together on ten bucks at the same time. And that's what I do a lot of times. I got three or four different shooters, and I'm trying to figure out the best time of year to hunt them. And a lot of times I'm like, well, I'm going to go throw a, a scouting set on this one. And uh, that's one thing I'm going to mention here that I didn't have on here. During this time of the year, um, are you doing any observation sets before you move, or are you just going off your scouting and trail cam data, and, and if you're going in, you're going in? Um, I do – I do – a lot of observation i don't typically do much observation sits you know so i do a lot of glassing a lot of trail cameras but i won't and it's just the areas that i hunt and have hunted in the past they just don't set up very well to maybe get in a tree like 200 yards away from where you actually want to be and then see a buck do something and then move in like your classic observation sit and then move in the next day what I'll do is I'll try to hang back as far as I possibly can. You know, I think glassing is really, really overlooked in the Midwest and East versus out. And I hunt out West a lot. So, you know, I know the importance of glassing and I have really good optics for that. So I utilize that here for whitetail and, you know, I'll hang back and watch, you know, it might be pulling my truck over on the side of the road, you know, a mile and a quarter away from, this little field edge and seeing a buck come out and, you know, so I, I do a lot of observation, but I don't do many observation sits. Um, but whether my observation be glassing or, um, trail cameras, you know, typically once I decide to go in, you know, I'm going all in and that typically works out more often than not for me. All right, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on the episode. I know you helped out somebody out there that's listening to this this time of the year um, to go out there and get on their target buck, man. Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, there you have it. The wrap for episode two of the next seven days series. I appreciate you guys tuning in all the way to the end. If you found any value in this episode um, that Ethan spit out there, could you please leave me a review wherever you're at on iTunes, Spotify? I greatly appreciate that. Hopefully you found a little tidbit information and you go out there and you kill your target buck this week. Um, everybody's season is almost open if it's not already open. So get ready to hunt hard, hunt smart, have a shitload of fun, guys. I appreciate you guys listening to this every week. Love you guys. Last week I forgot and I'm sure a lot of people were like, what the heck? But I uh, always try to do the right thing. Try to leave a legacy, and White to Legacy is out until next Wednesday when we're coming at you with Episode 3 of the Next 7 Days series.